Well, then let's pray real quick, and then we'll start up. All right. Thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for the sunshine instead of the rain everybody else is getting. We thank you for the fact that we can meet here and study your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that has the ability to allow us to learn whatever you might have tucked away in that book, and that you would allow us to be challenged by the Holy Spirit, to study if need be, learn whatever it needs to be learned, and live it out in the world as we leave this room. And as the holidays are coming up, Lord, I pray that anybody that's got stuff that's got to be done, that they start doing it ahead of time so that it's not a pressure-packed time. It's a time to enjoy fellowship and family. And be with us as we worry about the ones that go across the street because they're the ones that have to hear the gospel. And I hope that there's a group of them pray that the Holy Spirit has touched them and that they have the ability to understand exactly what's being spoken and that they can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ so that they can have an eternal life to go with the pleasure of this world that you allow us to have. We ask these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Has anybody heard anything from Steve about Steve Whitney? I haven't talked to Debbie in a couple of weeks. And I haven't heard anything because I know he got a bum report the last time he went to the thing I was visiting. I'll have to check that and see what she said. So, all right. Okay. Memory verse. 1 Thessalonians 4 9. It takes a load off of your plate if you haven't figured it out. And it says, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, brethren. Okay? And here's the deal. Let me ask you a question. Uh, who's writing the book? All right. Why is he writing it to them? Because they were the ones that stepped away from idols and were really getting heavy-duty teaching from the Holy Spirit, and they needed guidance in certain situations. They had problems arising. But he talked about the fact that they didn't have to worry about this particular thing. Need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Now look at the flipping words. There is nothing in that phrase that has doodle to do with you doing anything about knowing how to teach yourself how to love her. She might be so stinking unlovable it's impossible to love. Second thought, we'll pick somebody else out of the crowd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so here What I need you to understand is this is something that comes with the Spirit. This is why He can call you beloved. This is why Paul uses the term, John uses the term, is because this is something that is infused into you with the entrance of the Holy Spirit. And you need to realize that. And that's why the neat little words in there are touched or touching. Those are the words that are going to be trigger words for you. And the fact that taught is, is you and I think of taught as face to face with somebody else, somebody relaying information they have to you. Well, it's the same scenario, only it's on the spiritual plane. And it is not something that can be done by physical work or physical learning. Okay? What? What's it say at the bottom? Oh, no, it's actually reading the next one. Oh, okay. I was going to say. Nothing you can share? No, I just think it's pretty appropriate to what's going on in today's world. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> is it, the next one says, some, some Thessalonians, probably because of idleness, were taking undue interest in other people's affairs. Um, the Greeks, in general, thought manual labor degrading and fit only for slaves. Christians took seriously the need for earning their own living, but some of the Thessalonians, perhaps because of their belief in the imminent return of Christ, were neglecting work and relying on others to this is the first group that got white robes and tennis shoes and went up and sat on the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. serious. And it had to be addressed because they were so tired of what was going on. When we studied Thessalonians, you found that. They were so tired of what was going on that they just, when they came to Christ, it was like somebody had lifted a truckload off their shoulders and they said, Ooh, this is great. Let's just hang in here all the time. And they gave up on life, basically. And that's why, why they, they make those references because they had to be dealt with. Okay? And the thing of it is, is you need to understand, you stepping into Christianity, it is more of a work because you have to do spiritual battles than any physical battle you'll ever come across. 
All right. How many of you ever have taught in here? Taught, taught, taught. Anybody else? Taught, taught. Here's the deal. Do me a favor. Do you feel like somebody used your batteries up when you're done teaching? Yes. <laughs> Why is that? Okay. So there's a situation that has arisen in your internal parts that something has been drained. Okay. Now, here's the deal. The Lord tells you how to fix that. Okay? Come back to me. Put more of me in here. And automatically, what is the quickest you can charge your phone? Plug it in. Plug it in. And how long does it generally take now with the new batteries? How much? About an hour. Okay? Same deal. Only it's lightning quick. That's why when you start studying and you do something that the Lord's in, in, impressed you to do, you're deriving power from Him. You don't have to depend on your energy to do it because He'll do that. Now, you are going to have a letdown on the other side because your physical body has been, quote, unquote, boosted by the Holy Spirit. And then when the boosting is over, you settle back down to normal, and what happens to you? You go, and all of a sudden you feel like, you know, Wow, well, you know, I don't remember wrestling with anybody, but that's basically what it feels like. So now that's the situation. All right. So that's why, with all of these things going on, this is what the Thessalonians were dealing with over and over and over again. So you're very, very normal. Okay. So, all right. Now, this. This is for me because I'm like outside. Okay. We got to watch the hummingbird yesterday sitting on the branch and feeding and things, sitting on the branch, stretching its wings and doing all that kind of good stuff. Earth crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God. Okay, that's the that's the world you're looking at. I've been had people tell me that you shouldn't enjoy the earth. I'm like, get lost here off my page. I don't talk to you anymore. Okay? <laughs> but only he who sees. What kind of eyeballs are you looking with? Okay? Takes off his shoes. Why do you do that? Holy ground. Holy ground. All right? The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. They just feed the flesh. They do not realize what they are taking in. They don't realize what they're seeing. They don't associate the two worlds together. But if you have this ability to see this, how many of you were up early enough Friday morning to see the moon and two planets lined up on the all kinds of neat stuff out there, okay? So what I'm saying is, if you've got that mind, that's a mind you want, this is what you want to, this is the kind of mind you want to have. One that pulls in things that show you your Lord everywhere you go. Okay? That's what it's supposed to be. Alright? Okay, now, where are we at, boss? I'm going to be starting on page 39. Page 39. Okay. <coughs> 39. This is so as much as in me. Is that where we're at? Okay. I'm ready to piece the gospel that you are in Rome also. And we talked about the idiom. We did talk about that, right? So for my part, Paul has a job to do. Sorry, that'd be good. Trouble. Oh, okay. Okay. So page 39, here's the deal. When it talks about the idiom, we'll start right there just so we back up a little bit. It talks about the idiom. The idiom is something that is said in a course of conversation in Greek language that puts a whole idea together that I have something that is in me already. So from my part of a deal, everybody's getting ready for Thanksgiving. What part of your what, what, what's your deal? What's your part in that deal? I have to deep fry the turkey. Somebody else has to bring the butternut squash souffle. Somebody else has to bring the beans. Somebody has to bring the soda. Somebody, you see what I'm saying? This is when somebody, but when somebody talks Thanksgiving from that point on, they're thinking in terms of their part in Thanksgiving. That's what Paul's doing. All of us are believers, but my part in your being a believer and being in Christ makes me have to function in my position. His position is teacher. Okay? And he has to teach what was taught to him in the desert because he is taking the law 
and getting it transferred over to grace, and they've got to understand that. They've got to eliminate the law part and just strive for the grace part, and that's basically what's going on here. So it says, and he's eager to do it. He's ready, willing, and able in his eagerness to do it. That's in his spirit. He wants to teach the Roman believers, and here again it talks about the ones. There are Roman believers in the group of Roman believers that are going to be extra peaked. Peaked. Uh, what's the word? Picked? Is that a word? Deep. Holy Spirit picked you? Okay. Is that a real word? Selects. Okay. Select you. Okay. Holy Spirit's going to trigger people and they're going to learn more. Why? Because he's going, he's going to ignite gifts in these people and out of that body of believer there are going to be learners, they're going to be teachers, they're going to be pastors, they're going to be administrators. All of the things that need to be put out before a church are going to be instituted when he comes or the letter comes and starts teaching them. And that's what he's trying to get across to them. All right? Particular group to believers. And it says, and in Rome, which is where the whole thing is to take place, they are looking for him to come. Okay? They've already sent notes saying, how come you have, you visited all these churches up across the loop here, how come you haven't come to see us? When he says that he wants to preach. So he wants to proclaim the good news, the communication of all good news related to God. Doctrine that is an encouragement to all believers. Not just the high class ones, not the ones picked by the Holy Spirit to do more leadership, but all of them. They all want the information. How many of you think you're a stupid believer? Sometimes I, I feel pretty dumb. <laughs> Every now and again, they got to lift that rock and crawl out from under it. Huh? Okay, here's the deal. That's not. He never implies that anywhere along the line. And when you study the righteousness and justice part of it, there is not an IQ marker for you getting what the Spirit has to teach you. I told you, the Spirit knows every living cell, every part of your cell, knows exactly what you can learn, what you can't learn, and is going to institute those things in your life if you're available for that. Okay? And that's why he's talking this way. And it's not just at salvation. Okay? Doctrine for salvation is great. How many of you know how to start a race? Some dude stands over here and goes, boom. What happens then? You run. Alright, what do you do? Just run right behind the guy with the gun? What do you run? You run a course. Okay? That's your salvation. Salvation is nothing but the starter's gun. That's all it is. From that point on, you've got another job. You've got a... Anybody in here ever run cross country? Yeah? It stinks. <laughs> I enjoyed it. It was a person thing. You did it by yourself. And then you picked out somebody ahead of you or behind you, and you and you had a faux competition with that person. Okay? You always knew you did because as soon as you got on their heels, what did they do? They looked around and they tried to speed up. That's when you could test yourself against another individual. You pass them or you, they leave you in the dust. Same thing with your Christianity. You're going to point somebody, you're going to pick somebody, you're going to say, I'm going to try to meet that point. And you're going to do that. And that's what these folks were doing. They're saying, look, we got to have a goal. We got this shooting match on the way. Now we got to know where we're headed. And he said, be glad to tell you. And that's exactly what he did. And he said, well, not just salvation, but the happy and the good. So what are we talking about? Happy and good in Christ. Number one, what's joy in Christ? You knowing your position and contentment in that position. Okay? And the next part, what's when, when he talks about good in Christ, what's that? Generally, it's going to be truth. But it's going to be truth with intrinsic good. Real, solid, God-led good. Which means if you've got a task to do in Christ, and you want to know whether it's of Him, go through some test kitchens and find out whether that's where you're supposed to be. Put a foot out there. Try something. And if you, you just keep petitioning, keep going into the program. That's how they did it. Okay? That's why you can have people in Thessalonica pulling up all their stops and say, well, I'm done. I'm done tent making. By God, I'm, I'm in Jesus. I don't have to do another thing. And the rest of them were grumbling about it. 
Well, what did they do when they grumbled? They sent a letter to Paul. And Paul sent a letter back. Same thing. You petition the Lord. Ask Him about stuff that's going on in your life. Put it down before Him and let Him work it out. That's how these things come about being done. Okay? Flip it. Four in 16, I am not ashamed of the Gospel. And the of Christ ain't not in the original. Now why would that be? There's only one. So. <laughs> there's only one. And there's only one conversation being had. There's only one individual that went to the cross. So they, that is not something that's in there. So when somebody said gospel to an individual walking back in Paul's time, there was not any doubt at all what they were speaking about. None. Okay? They never called Jewish information or Jewish teachings gospel. They had different terms for it. Torah. What were all the terms they had for those books? All the, all the different terms. Never did it say gospel. It never said good news. Is there a confusion now? Uh, yeah, I'm afraid there is because you've got more different kinds of gospel than Heinz has pickles. Okay? You got some with this and some with that. I had a, 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 a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> Jehovah Witness. You got... <laughs> I'm sorry, I gave the article of the baptism of the dogs to, <laughs> the wrong person. to our resident uh, procurer of dog baptisms. The thing about it is, is you have to understand, people, people are trying to make the gospel um, to where they are acceptable. Yes, soft, okay, friendly. But the problem is they don't realize that the when they when they friendly it up, they it loses its power. Inclusive. Inclusive. Yes, inclusive. We want everybody in the house. See? So they were baptizing man's best friend. So they were baptizing man's best friend. Where have yeah. you been the last? I'm sorry, not. <laughs> yes, they I'm are. A cat person. They, gener they really and truly are because. Of the, the I, and the, you have to understand. I have exactly what you're saying. The inclusiveness. The inclusive everybody. You don't want anybody to think. Well, if I'm really, really tight with my cat, and my cat could possibly be going to hell. Okay. <laughs> I might want to. I might want to work on that program. Well, I'm just telling you. But the thing of it is, is all it takes is for somebody to have that thought in their head, and somebody to address that thought from a position of authority. And what happens to that individual? Woohoo! I'm going to glom onto that guy like there's no tomorrow because that's part of. Yes, ma'am. My dog ate a whole loaf of bread last week. Would that save her? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> for the next two years. <laughs> Depends on what kind of leaven was in it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's Publix butter bread. Oh, oh, no. No. I'm thinking oh salvation is probably not at the end of that program, okay? I <laughs> still <laughs> know I got some. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you did. <laughs> all right. So here's the deal with all of this. You've got, you have to understand that when, when it comes to salvation stories and what Christ does, if the story is not the same, you have to pay attention to the story and find out where it varied from the truth. That's why when he tells them, Paul's going to tell them truth. There are oodles of it out there. And back in their days, it was, it was Hellenistic. It was Greek. All of the different cultures all tried to to squeeze in around Christ. And then after Christ died, what did they try to do? They tried to meld their philosophy with faith. That's what's been going on over the over the centuries. People trying to do that. All of them. Aristotle, all these guys all tried to do that. And they couldn't do it. So you have to you just understand, you getting genuine truth out of a book, even little bits and pieces, you're light years ahead of anybody else that's sitting under bogus teaching. Because, I mean, I've made people leave this class because of what they believe. Not made. Yeah. I mean, when I'm offensive enough, you leave. <laughs> okay? Their choice. And the reason is, how many people are sitting in this room? You didn't make them leave. They left because of you. Well, yeah, that, that's a nice way to say it. Yeah. But here's the deal. So. 40 people. I, 
I'm responsible. I'm responsible for what is is spread, basically, what's taught. Okay? And if I see somebody that's outside the pram framework of this book and they're trying to push it, I'm sorry. I will not allow 40 or 50 people to go out of here scrambling. I'm not going to let that happen. That is one of the tenures that you have as a teacher is to pay attention to the wolves that are trying to gobble up the sheep. Okay? And if you don't like the job, don't take the job. Because you're not getting Christmas cards from those folks anymore, okay? I probably get more heretic Christmas cards than I do normal ones because that's just, I mean, that's just the way it is. But what did Christ get? The same thing. So you just pay attention to that. So it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Yes, ma'am, what were you going to say? Nothing. Oh, okay. I saw it was almost out. No, I was just quoting along with you. Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So he's speaking in terms of himself. Okay. Was he ashamed of the gospel before he came to Jesus Christ? No, he was a zealot to kill it. Okay? Wasn't afraid of it. Wasn't ashamed of it. He thought it was a problem. So that's what he dealt with on that side. Now, he's on the other side of the fence. And he is not afraid or ashamed to tell anybody what he believed, what has happened to him, and where he went. Okay? and ashamed and it says no place for shame or guilt in a believer's life you see that's underlined <clears throat> you are doing yourself a tremendous disservice if you enter into that program at all okay and I want you to understand something when you sin which you are going to do there is no guilt or shame associated with it. How many of you got caught taking cookies out of the cookie jar? How many of you went and unwrapped your Christmas presents before Christmas? Oh, look, now the hands are starting to go up. Okay. What I want you to understand is, did you feel guilty? <laughs> I've been crushed my whole life. Yeah. But the thing of it is, is in Christ, what did He do for every sin you could possibly perpetrate? He died for it. It is gone. Okay? You tell Him that you did it. You tell Him that you admit it. You tell Him you're tickled, slapped to death. He died for it. And you go on. Okay? And you're not going to do it anymore. Well, that would be nice. I mean, that's a lie, but that would be nice. That's part of repentance. Part of it, yes. Repentance is also something that is not physical. Repentance is a surrender program. You surrender to the Holy Spirit, and when you surrender to the Holy Spirit, you're not going to make that same bone decision again under normal circumstances. Okay? But do me a favor. Understand this. <coughs> Satan already put that one on the bulletin board. He will run it by every now and again to make sure you haven't forgot what you did with the with the spirit the last time. Okay? He's going to slip that rascal in there because you've already stumbled over that rock once. He'd love to have you do it again. And it's even more better if he can have a couple of Christians see you stumble. Okay? And you're the ones that see stumblers. What do you do with a stumbler? Kick dirt in their face and keep on going? No. You help them up. He says, is there anything I can do? pray or whatever I need to do to help you get over this impediment that you've got. Now what have you just done? You've just done brotherly love. You've just done that. Okay? God's in everything around you. He's in that individual that fell and scuffed his nose. You're going to get him up. You're going to get the neosporm out. You're going to plaster that rascal with neosporm. Put a band-aid over it. Then you're not going to laugh at him because he's got a band-aid on his nose. Got it? That's how you function. Alright? There we go. Now, <clears throat> you're above being ashamed. Life is to be free from shame. And I'm going to tell you, here's the last part. Stick it on the refrigerator. 
those. When you find yourself not being ashamed of talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will know without a shadow of a fact that you are now maturing in Christ. You are comfortable with what you are and what you know about the one that allowed you to be who you are. Okay? You ought to see people when, they, when they're not used to... When, how many of you try to find things at Home Depot now that they've moved everything? <laughs> <laughs> wow. okay. When I go into Home Depot, I know now that things are, I know some of the places of things, but there are some things that, you know, I have not have a clue as to why they separated them where they separated them. So I'll go in and I'll stop and I'll just, I'll just go, okay, Lord, I remember where the toilet rings, the wax rings were last time. Is the Holy Spirit and I, can we find those toilet wax rings again this time? And somebody will walk up and say, what are you doing? I said, the Holy Spirit and I are trying to find the wax rings in this building. <laughs> and you have to see the look on their face for a second. And I, they think I'm kidding. I said, I swear I'm not. I said, because the carnal Bobby would like to blow this store up every time I can't find the wax ring. <laughs> And they, they look at you and they say, well, uh, can I help you? I said, only if you know where the wax rings are. And some of them do, some of them don't. But the thing of it is, is they're not used to people having that kind of conversation with them. And the next time you come in the store, do you know what they do? They know where the wax rings are. They know, yeah. Are you looking for wax rings this time? No, we're looking for something else. It's in the trim line, okay? So all I'm telling you is, you, you can have an influence on people just by interacting, get, you know, getting into their face that way. When the Jehovah Witness guy came by the house yesterday with this little, is he, are they the ones with the Wake Up magazine or Awaken? Yes. Or, what, oh, okay. All right. And he said, well, how are you doing? And I said, a lot better than you. <laughs> <laughs> and he stopped for a moment and he said, well, what do you mean? I said, I know Jesus Christ. And I said, I'm going to hang out in eternity. Where are you going? Uh... Well, I just want to give you this book. I said, if it doesn't tell me about Jesus Christ and hanging out in eternity, I don't think I'm interested. He said, well, if you read it, he said, if I read it, I'm really going to cru crucify you next time you come. <laughs> and he said, well, I said, yeah. I said, the crucifixion part, that's the part you don't get. And he said, well, um, that's all it was. They went back out the car and left. <laughs> well, he wasn't walking. No, it was a car full of people, and I, I, I didn't I didn't know there were people there because there was a reflection on the thing and I couldn't see in the car. But here's the deal: my next question was, "You're doing this because you want to come, you want to get into heaven, right?" I said, "You guys are activated for you know, you get yourself, work yourself into heaven." And I took him to that verse in Corinthians. I said, "You know, the bad thing about that is, it says works don't do anything for you if you don't know Jesus Christ." And and this is an older guy. <clears throat> so I'm just telling you, there are times when you can be sweet and kind, and there are times when you know somebody is coming up to you and they're in direct association with Satan and his minions, and you need to cut them off at the knees. And in John, it tells you, 1 John or 3 John, one of the Johns, the old the, the Johns at the back, it tells you, do not bid them have a good day. When they show up with untruth in front of you. Okay? So you need to realize that you have a position in Christ. And a position is true. And you cannot you cannot abandon that. Paul did never abandon what he he knew. He never did do that. Alright? So here's the deal. Um, and, it, and it talks about different things. Why did Peter this is just why did Peter weep so bitterly after the cock crowed. He was one of them. He was ashamed of being ashamed. Now, how did that affect Peter? You never want to enter into that little scenario because it took an eye-to-eye -eye meeting with Jesus Christ to bring him out of the pit that he had dug for himself. Okay? So realize that. You don't ever have to go through any of that. 
I mean, I know that, um, I, you know, as, as perfect as some of the people in here are, I'm sure they have foibles. Well, understand that the guy that you believe in, Jesus Christ, he knows all about them. So just, just so you know. And he and keeps on going and talks the shame of the gospel, good news of victory, good fortune of intrinsic value, the whole realm of doctrine. In other words, good news, point salvation on, is everything else doctrinally sound that you can learn. That's how you grow. That's how you function. That's how you get your act together. All right? And it says, the purpose of the way, and this is to, okay? Here's the word to. And it really means you're going to go into something. Your salvation experience takes you into a whole other realm. And the realm is you're going to have your spiritual body awakened and functioning again like it never has before. And as you do those things, there are blessings that are involved in that. You're going to be, how many of you have grandkids? How many would you like to be able to give them solid answers to the world's disgusting questions? You're in an entity right now belonging to the Holy Spirit and belonging to Jesus Christ that you have the ability to disseminate that truth in a functional way. You do not have to make it lurid. You don't have to make it disgusting. You can go right to the book and point any one of these out. Okay? I mean, I tried it. My, I, asked, we asked, I asked Josh, I said, do you have a girlfriend up there? He said, Lord, no, Dad. I said, why? He said, they're all gold diggers. I said, what do you mean? He said, everybody up here is making big money and they're looking for a, a happy ride home. I said, well, what makes you say there's not a good one up there? Have you, I said, he said, I can't send you enough pictures. He said, it's just not the place you want to do this. He said, I found a little church. He said, but I don't even trust them. And I said, wow. So what do I, how do I pray? All For all the troops, for all my kids, how do I pray? That the, the right person is out there and the right person shows up, they have the discernment to see it. That's all I, that's all I want. Okay? And the thing about it is, is you have to understand when he's talking about these folks here, I have the whole realm of doctrine to work from. I want the whole realm of doctrine to work from. I want to learn as much as I can so I can disseminate information. Just like Paul. He's got it all. He's got it disseminated. And he says, you know, the power that he has to disseminate the gospel is his ability and capacity. He is filled to capacity. He is now overflowing. He is now looking for some place to dump the information. And he's getting more and more venues as more and more of these churches start to generate a, a venue for his information. Nobody else ever got any of this information. Nobody. They figure Julius Caesar was one of the smartest people, people that, that of that particular era brain-wise. I mean, with his capabilities, his mental capacity, he was not of the Lord, but he was part of the Lord's plan. He knew how to institute law. He put uh, boundaries on things. He showed the people in areas, common areas, that they could be part of Rome without having Rome influence their lives if you'll just swear allegiance to Rome. That's all you had to do. You didn't have to do anything else. That's why Jewish people could have their synagogues and, and this one could have that and that one could have that. Well, they were all that way. Well, as far as everything else goes, he was perfect for that. Paul is the next one on the list that they talk about being universally known to be intelligent and to be used of God. Even the historians say he was used of an entity higher than man because of what he put out as far as spiritual material that is dwelt, that is used. You realize that even the Torah has sayings from this guy. And why? Because he takes Old Testament stuff and puts it in it. And then you go to the Quran, the same thing. Whatever's in there, it can be looped over into what Paul has said at different times. They just he was, he was universally used. Well, that's why he says, I've got the ability and I've got the power. And he said, of God, he said, of God to bless, forgive, save, provide. So what could he do every time he started a church? He could go and start the church. It did not have autonomy yet. It was still under his tutelage. He could go to people and convince them and, and give them the information of salvation and they would accept Christ. All of these things on the list are things that he could do. Why? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he always gave that program to the Holy Spirit. He said, this is not me. This is what you got because I was endued with the Holy Spirit. All right? And he said... One thing that did at the very end of this, it says of God, what happens to you when you get talked 
into or convinced by the Holy Spirit to step into Jesus Christ and you say yes, you get the character of God. That's why when your mouth works, your mouth ought to work like you have the character of God. I have to be careful of that. I, I get so mad at ignorant, stupid drivers. I would just, if I had a, if I had 50 cows on the front of the truck, I would clean the highway before I went down through the middle of it. It is just, rudeness is really beyond me. I just get really, in, I get incensed by it. Okay? And if they do it in church, it's even worse. I'll rip your arms off and hand them to you if you do that kind of nonsense in church, and I see it. I've seen them step on too many saints. I do not appreciate it at all. So I have to hand that to the Lord pretty regularly. Like Katie. Okay? So... I'm just saying, you don't think you're excluded from anything. You're not. So, and it talks about, it is. This is the gospel. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. You've read it again and again and again. It runs down to everything that is the gospel. This is what he is going to teach them over and over and over and over and over and over. And he said, it keeps on being, okay, the way or the purpose or the, the direction to salvation. If you generate the gospel to anybody, in any form, whether it's your lifestyle, whether it's the fact that you know Scripture, whether it's the fact that you know this particular Scripture, the result of you doing that is going to be somebody intertwining with the Holy Spirit and coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is the exclusive purpose of good news. After that, then you can attach the doctrinal side of it. Then you can tell somebody, you know, if you're having a problem with this in your life, here's doctrine that will show you how to conquer it. But again and again, you never have to tell somebody that they're a sinner and they need to come to Jesus Christ. There is not an individual on planet Earth unless he is totally idiotically ignorant that doesn't realize that he makes mistakes. And those mistakes on God's chart are sometimes called sins. So it's not that tough to do. And he says... In his salvation, this is your adjustment to the justice of God. Salvation is what that, that is what it is to you and I. And it says to everyone. That really should say anyone. Okay? God had a desire, or he would never have put man and woman on planet Earth in a perfect environment with a perfectly functioning spirit. He wanted to have fellowship with that entity. Okay? There's no way for us to know why. We don't know whether he was lonely. <laughs> we have no clue. But he did. And when that went the way of the wind, in his omnipotence, he set up the plan for getting us back. Okay? He knew he couldn't have intimate relationships with us except through a third party, which would be Jesus Christ. And that's basically what it's talking about. Um, how many of you realize what the term ecumenical means? You heard that term over at, at any... I've been hearing it since I was 15. Okay? It started with the... Uh, Council of Churches. Alright? And the Council of Churches is a bunch of churches all getting together and all saying, oh, we're all going to go this way. Okay? Um, and the reason I, I, I asked that question is, and, and somebody was talking about the salvation story and whether you're getting the right gospel or anything, here are some of the questions that people ask. People, they're questions and types of statements. People say, all religions are good. Now, how do you think about that? Why do you shake your head? What makes you shake your head about that statement? I think they have a place. Okay, they have a place. What would the place be? Sometimes it's just for uh, like talking about the softer ones. Okay, like get All somebody right. who wouldn't otherwise be involved involved. Okay, All right. I'm just asking because. Here, I mean, you have to understand, the only book I have to go by when it comes to a question like that is that book you got parked on your lap. Okay? That's the only one. Um, 
Do me a favor, turn to John 4, 19 through 26. You're going to talk about the woman at the well. Alright? Here's the deal. And the reason is, is because Paul's going to have to get this across to the Romans. He can't get this idea across to the Romans. They could fracture and break up and just not become a church. Alright? Because you've got... As a matter of fact, this verse right here... Um, this that verse right there is a good indicator of what happens with salvation. Okay, when I become saved and Scott becomes saved, we can have a rapport between us that is not earthly. Okay. I can ask him questions. He can respond to my questions. He can ask a question. I respond to his questions. It's going to be on an entirely different level than what it would be if I met him on the street because whatever he does for a living, I haven't got a clue and I couldn't do it if I had to. And I'll, I don't know whether he can do my job or not. But on another level, I can totally talk to him anytime I want to. All right? That is what comes with salvation. That's what unifies a body. All right? And with all of these things, when it comes to that particular question, could somebody read 4, 19 through 26 real quick. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Just in 21 or? Yeah. Yeah, just stick it in here. It's all the way through 26. Oh, okay. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I, I who speak to you am he. Now, do you understand that conversation? First off, the lady said what? And you have to understand, she was a dog. <laughs> if you want a nice term for it. Okay? And they worshipped on this mountain. They knew of the Messiah. They were familiar with the Messiah. They had some information, okay, info. And he's telling them that everybody over here in Jerusalem that were, what would you call these, civilized. Okay, civilized. It's pretty close, isn't it? Okay. All right. They had all, they had, well, they think they, think they had all the info. Okay. Now, what do you got going on there? All religions are fine. That's the statement by a lot of the world. Okay? I even heard uh, some of the fancy dance guys that were smart people in the Christian thing saying there are, are um, multiple ways to... What do you think about that? False doctrine. Yeah, false doctrine. What would you, well, what about the first one? What was wrong with the first one? All right. Here's the deal. She had some information. What did Jesus tell her about her information? Yeah. You tell, what did he do? How did he get into her head? Tell her how many dead God husbands she had. Okay? So he already has a little, a little niche with her, but here's what he told her. He says, you guys have information. I'm telling you, it's not all accurate. He says, they have information. It is not all accurate. He said, but there's going to come a time, and please understand something, you are in the time that they're speaking of. That everybody is going to come to Him in spirit and in truth. And there's no mountains at all. Now, you have got to have the discernment. Paul's going to tell them again and again and again. You've got to have the discernment because Paul's being sent to the dogs. Okay? Jesus Christ has a perfect place for dogs called heaven. 
All right? Just want you to know. So here's the deal. And what's happening with this group over here that think they have all the information? They're falling off the charts because pride has entered into the program. And he's telling them, here's a group, and here's a group, and you guys are doing battle over what in the name of common sense you're going to believe. And he said, I'm telling you, that's going to go away. You need to be aware of what people are teaching because you need to know whether it's this, this, or this. And if you knew how much of this was in the world today, it would scare the living daylights out of you. What I mean is there are so many people trying to hook up law with grace that it is just unbelievable. And it is causing people again and again not to have a handle on what they are. And then they're thwarting what Jesus Christ can do in their life because he said, immediately when you try to stick law on it, means you're trying to do something. And when you try to do something, you're not getting, getting anywhere in the program. And so you've got that question. You've got the other question. And the last question is this one. There are many ways to heaven. And this here's this one. Um, we all worship the same. What's the word? It's what's out there. I'm sorry. I've back. had people tell me, well, you know, and, and I tell you, Richard's not here today. You know the easiest way to tell whether somebody's on, on the wrong path when you ask them to tell them why they should be entered, why they should be allowed into heaven? What do they say? Well, I was a good person. I'm so glad. There's a couple of good seats for you. Get help. <laughs> it all comes back to they want anything that will make them acceptable in what they are now. Yeah. And it, what's that called? Compromised religion. Right. And Jesus said, I'm not a religion. I'm a program. I'm a system. Okay? And please understand something. And, and, not that, and the reason that these questions all end up being asked is because they don't like the other answer. They don't like giving up the... the, 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 the prestige of where they are. They don't like giving up the control of their life. That All makes of these them things. feel like they're unacceptable. And well, I, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's all a ploy from their, from their sin nature and from Satan. And how many of you consider yourself unacceptable? Are you unacceptable? <laughs> she tries not to be. <laughs> yes! But if you but eat of this you. fruit, you will be like God. Right back there to their original thing. <laughs> yeah, really. It's, it's the same God like it. It's the last egg on apple I eat. Yeah. But the deal of it is, your mindset has to be, I am acceptable no matter what. Absolutely. But we do unacceptable things at times. Oh, yes. You're allowed to do that. That is that's that's a caveat for for Christianity with an with an earth suit that has a sin nature. Okay. But then again, I gave you a verse that says you don't have to do that. You can enter into it. You see the sin, and you can step away from the sin so you don't have that problem. Okay? That's the fun part. All right? How many of you like turning your back on a sin? How many of you feel like downtrodden when you do it? Well, that was a good sin, and I done let that rascal get away. <laughs> <laughs> does, any, does anybody do that? <laughs> well, I'm, just, I'm just asking. Because, I mean, they present themselves... And Woody, how do you respond? I mean, Paul's telling these folks, look, you got salvation, now I've got to show you how to respond to all the stuff that's going to come onto your plate. Okay? And Christ tells you, in me, I've got a power grid that says you can turn down every one of those. Okay? You do it all the time and you don't realize it. That's the nice part. You've even got beyond that. Okay? So they, that's what he's that's what he's wrestling with here. And it says, and when he when he's talking to the woman at the well, he says, "Understand something, woman. You got some information. I'm glad you have the information. And how do you know she didn't get the picture? She said because Messiah said he would come and he would tell us all things. And when he said, I'm the one that has the living water, what did did it did it make sense to her at first? No. But she shagged it back to town. And what did she tell those folks in town? There's this dude out here at the at the well." And that guy told me how many husbands I had. And what happened after that? Everybody and their uncle was headed for the well. Why? You think that one wanted to go, tell me how many husbands I had. 
do I have any with me? Why is I that? No, they want to know how an individual at a well that was obviously Jewish was talking to a Semite woman and had a conversation with her and told her about living water and a Messiah. That's why. They had the information. That's what Rome is like. Got the information. Now they got to know which direction to go with it. And that's what he's doing with what he's doing here. All right? Now, flip it over. The other side, it says, with what's going on, it says, salvation to everyone believing. Okay? This is the mechanics of salvation. This is you being presented with it in common grace. Holy Spirit's doing His thing. And you have a, a, a time when you nod your head or you, your scales are removed and you step into it. And that's basically what it's talking about. Static present. Only way is to believe in Jesus Christ. That's why this and this and this are stumbling blocks to people. But Jesus Christ can overcome all those stumbling blocks strictly with the good news in Corinthians. That's how He does that. Okay, And it says, to the Jew, okay, Client nation at the time, and it's racial Jews too. I want you to understand, they didn't want anybody else to have it at all. That was something that was given to them. Do you realize why circumcision was so important to to nation Israel? They were the only ones that had it, and it was their get into heaven card. And you know what Christ did on the cross? He took away their car. And that did, they didn't like that at all. Alright? There you go. And it says, firstly, now why does He say that? Okay? Nation Israel was pulled aside for a purpose and it was a purpose to exhibit Jesus Christ and exhibit God and His power over all other nations on planet Earth. And it said they are first in privilege. And he will notice that again and again and again and again. When it comes to Jews, Paul will say something. And he, when he says first in privilege, he means first in privilege. That's why all these people say, well, don't worry about it. Blow them off the charts. That's garbage. First in privilege does not go away. It might move off of the first line of the program, but God did not take them out of the program. He has put them on the shelf for a while, and when they come back on the shelf, boy, you talk about all kinds of stuff happening. That's what's going to happen, and that's why he put it this way. First opportunity to adjust to the justice of God was given to nation Israel. They did it every time they believed something they couldn't see, did not have security in, and didn't have a clue as to how come it was in their life. I don't know how you produce a race out of nothing. But that's exactly what Jesus Christ and, the, and God and the Holy Spirit did with nation Israel. Okay? How could it change their looks? How could it change their program? How could it change? I don't know, but it did. And that's why they talk of it this way when it says firstly, and it says, and then the Greeks. Because you and I are Greeks. Okay? And understand something. You might be grafted into the vine of Abraham. No doubt. But you're grafted into a vine that right now the fruit is being produced on a particular stretch of that vine and the rest of it is sitting in a pruned position waiting for buds, waiting for new growth, and waiting for the last whoopee, whoo <laughs> the last whoopee out of, out, of, out of heaven. That's all they're doing. I almost caught it. Pretty good from what I got. Okay? But here's the deal. With all of the things that are going on with them, they're aware of their status. They still think they're premier in, 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 in God's plan. Okay? That's arrogance, by the way, just in case you hadn't figured it out. So, flip the page here. We'll get, get to 42. Of course it landed tip down. <laughs> oh, it did, didn't it? Oh, yeah, we'll have another burial service right after class. Hang on, I got another one right here. Okay, just in case we need it. Now, what was I at? Next page. Here we go. Now, and it says, For therein is the righteousness of God. Now, what are we talking about here? You got to have understand what he's. You got to pay attention to the fact that the stuff you just read, 
oh, gospel and all that kind of good stuff under salvation. It does this. It does this thing for you, and the thing that it does for you is this sticks you. Okay, there you go. Now, here's what he's talking about. For if therein there is a righteousness of your God revealed from faith to faith. You've been plugged into God's righteousness. That's what you need to realize over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? You're a source of God's righteousness. It doesn't matter whether you believe it. doesn't matter whether you exhibit it. doesn't matter whether or not you even have a clue about it. If you accepted Jesus Christ, you're going to be that way. You're going to have consternation in your life if you're not aware of it because you cannot play in that playground and expect not to have repercussions from it. Okay? Do you realize when it talks about the jobs of the Holy Spirit, one of the main ones is to make you aware of unrighteousness that has been entered into your life. Okay? Different from sin. First John tells you they're split. He'll you know, forgive you of sins and cleanse you from unrighteousness. All. Two categories. You're slipping into the one category of right, unrighteousness every now and again. Why? Because you've got an earth suit that is stuck full of nasties. Okay? But he says right here, flat out, he says, you have, quote unquote, revealed in you the righteousness of God from faith to faith. What are we talking about? How does that work? How does faith to faith work? It means you have salvation faith. That's the initial one you're going to get. And then you have faith that is instrumental with doctrine that is put into you. Alright? And it's, it's from pistis to pistua. So what it amounts to is you're going to have this kind of faith that's original. This is the peachy everything's rainbows and unicorns right after you come to Jesus. Okay? And then after that, reality sets in and you realize that your sin nature didn't leave Dodge on the last train and you still got that rascal. And then other things are coming into your life that wake you up to, well, you know, I've got things going on in my program here that aren't from the last program. And when it happens, then you need to know how to do battle. And that's what you're doing right here with all of this. And he says, if, if you pay attention to how he says it, it's an idiom, again, the justice that's in you now belongs to God. Okay? It's not yours. It's being exhibited in you. When you help somebody, um, I was in a bank the other day, and the lady that was there, she couldn't have something happen, and she was getting a little bent out of shape, so she pulled it out the door, and she left her glasses laying on the thing. So I picked her glasses up, and I said, Yo! And she looked back at me and like, who the heck are you? I said, uh, you going to need these? Oh, yeah. Changed her whole demeanor. Then I get back in line, same place. And a guy comes up to the door in a wheelchair. There wasn't no way in God's way. I think I didn't have enough muscle on him to, to, to get the handle, let alone open the door. So I went over and opened the door. And then I let him in, and he was just tickled, slapped to death. I get back in line, and the guy's, guy said, well, three's the charm, the guy behind me. I said, is there anybody else falling apart in here? And, and they all looked around and they said, no. And the lady said, well, that was very nice of you. I said, no, that was intrinsic in me. And she looked at me and said, oh, no, what, what are you? <laughs> and I said, no, that's the Christ that I love. He tells me to do that for the least of these. And she said, you're, you're right. So, you, now do you understand that this is, you have these potentials everywhere you go? Opportunities. Every, huh? Opportunities. Yeah, truckloads of them. Your response to it, and how, how does the justice of God get through my mouth? I mean, it's got a heck of an obstacle course up here, okay? But when it comes out, it's really neat to see. It's fun to watch, okay? And then you, we've got, you know, when it comes to this stuff, and we probably won't get finished. Almost, almost done. 
Um, but I listed out, if you'll, if you'll pay attention, I listed out justice belonging to God down here, the doctrine of adjustment. And it talks about divine grace administered through the character or person or the essence of God. That's common grace when it comes to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And what God provides in grace cannot and must not be compromised. That's why you pay attention to the different religions. What God has offered is not a compromising package. Okay? How many of you go, uh, you can go to the store now and you can buy a cover, you can buy a switch that has a variable dimmer. dimmer yes only now they have it so that you can get the dimmer and you can get five different covers for the dimmer okay they're trying to meet up so that there's not just ivory and white and the thing about it is is understand something there is one switch and dimmer with God there are no alternative covers just one he says, this is how you do it. You cannot vary from that. Why? Because his justice and his righteousness put this package together that delivered holiness to you. And in delivering holiness to you, it cannot be compromised. You have to understand, everything that he runs through your life that is good or in chastisement or in, in making you turn directions has already been filtered through justice and righteousness. So it is coming to you in a perfect form. Okay? That's what he's laying out for them. He said, the righteousness of God that you will get in Rome is the same one that was introduced into me in the desert. We are on the same plane. There is never an lording over of anything. So we made it to page 42, boss. Probably number two. All right. And then next week, you make sure you have your notes for 18, too, because we're going to go to your next group of notes. And I think we already have them all, do we not? You don't have some? Okay, I've got some at home. I, didn't, I know I have, you I passed them out, so you had the whole book. I have an extra. You got an extra 18? All right. There you go. Another batch of notes. I'll bring some next week in case people don't have it. All right. I've got Steve, Lisa, Myra, Melissa, Pam, Ken, Ralph, and any and all the other ones that people tell us about. Staff and service. I put a request in for cool weather. Sorry. Uh, Shirley and Larry doing well. Doc McGee, keep him in your prayers. I think he's in Atlanta now, if I'm not mistaken. But he was having problems with some of his medications. I think the VA got him squared away. I hope they did. Um, servicemen. The holidays coming up. Start paying attention to that. Travelers, people that are on the road. Josh sent me a picture the other day. It was 27 in North Dakota. <laughs> so I don't think I need that much cool weather, but but he was jealous. And I rubbed it in just so you know. Um, Tom's is he driving? Is he flying back? To, does anybody know how Tom's getting back? Did he drive up there? He's flying back. He's flying back. Okay. <laughs> That's a good thing. As long as he's not piloting the plane, we're all right. Okay. Just want to make sure. Pray for Tom and grandson Chris. Tom, come home Thursday. Um, and then Lois for Bobby Byron family. Bobby was killed in Orlando last week. Bobby and his brother were dorm neighbors of Marshall at college. Bobby was from San Diego, California. How? Car accident or did it um, I don't know. The only thing I know is the uh, the little the. He's, he was 21, and his little brother is a freshman there with Marshall. And he lives right across the hallway, and they, they were close. They were in Marshall's room almost every day, you know, the video right. games. And uh, I guess something happened, and the, the, the younger brother came back to school, and Marshall sat with him until he got his, someone to take him to the airport on wow. his flight to go back to San Diego. But I, but the kid was 21. Wow. And no clue why these things happen. Oh, well. And Lowell Lowe had a stroke a couple of weeks ago. Is he doing any better? He was, he was in the hospital for about a week, and now he's in a rehab center here. Okay. I knew he was in Orlando when it happened, yeah. I guess. And 
close to the hospital, so that was good. But they were going to try to they were, they were going to try to inject them with the same stuff they stuck in Doc Rob, Doctor James Robinson. No, no, Dobson. When Dobson had his stroke, they shot him with that stuff, and it clears the clot and clears up the damaged area quickly if you do it within a certain number of times. I'd already had a little bit of a relapse, but I, don't, I haven't heard too much other than that. So just keep them in your prayers. Because I know Mrs. isn't doing that great either. So they're wearing out folks. It was a good story, though. She said that she drove him to the hospital. And she says, you know, hindsight, should have called 911. But she, I guess, pulled it up on her phone and kind of had an idea. She is at a traffic light, got out, <laughs> asked the next vehicle, you know, and this is tourist town. Yeah. <laughs> Chances to find somebody yeah. knew what in the world was going on. Oh, yeah. You're uh, Mickey place. Mouse is over that way. Yeah. And he knew exactly. You're really close. Turn right at the next oh. light and it's down on the right. And oh, wonderful. I'm like, how many people knew <laughs> in that bunch of cars where the hospital? I yeah. didn't. I worked there. I didn't. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Well, good. So just keep me in your prayers. Put it on the list and say, we'll do it. All right. Let's pray and I'll turn you loose. Thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for your blessing. Thank you for the way that you open your scriptures to us. Pray that you allow us to have information that is beneficial to us, that will challenge us during the course of the week, and that we would do things that would just bring honor and glory to your name, no matter what we, how, how it comes about. We just give you all the praise and glory for it in Christ's name. Amen.